I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. Pastor Howard, we have arrived at the final lesson of this quarter. Indeed, we have. All about the promise, God's everlasting covenant. And the last lesson is entitled, The New Covenant Life. I may come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's exactly right. Now, what does it mean to have life? Is it just, you know, I, I, Sometimes we look at a lesson and we think, we typically kind of toss away, I don't want to say toss away Sabbath yes. afternoon, but this one made a great point on Sabbath afternoon, a substantive point in the intro this week, talks about how the covenant life experience is not just a layaway plan for some way down the road when Jesus mm. comes and eternal life, that the new covenant life can start now and it's better than the old life and it, it's we're talking about how life starts even now, that eternal life that God offers. So it's going to be a great study, yes. a lot of good points. And it's interesting to note also that the new covenant life it was always the life of faith. So in other mm -hmm. words, it didn't. you don't have to wait till Jesus died on the cross to live the new covenant life. Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before. And covenants weren't dispensational, like this way, this time right. you were saved this way. It's like the the true everlasting covenant, salvation covenant, was mm -hmm. always accessible, and this is the kind of life that God wanted man to live all the way through. Amen. Yeah, so we're going to dive into that one this uh, fully this week, and it's going to be an enjoyable study. And I've, I've learned that I really, all the lessons are good, of course, but the last study of almost every quarter, at least the last three now, yes. have been about like really positive, upbeat, mm -hmm. encouraging, looking forward, hopeful, and yes. this one doesn't disappoint either. So I'm good. excited about that. So why don't you, this week, why don't you give us a word of prayer, yeah, and then I'll walk through our talking points. Father in heaven, again, we are so thankful for your word of truth and the message of hope it brings to us. I pray that as we review this lesson, uh, it would be a blessing to us again and also to those who are watching, uh, whether they be students or teachers. Uh, we're all students of your word. And again, we just thank you for Jesus and the testimony we have, the evidence of him through your word. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Okay. Talking point number one. Talking you point didn't walk us through the talking points No, yet. but we're, do, we're doing do it that. right now. Number one, the new covenant gives you a new heart. Now, I, let me, as we're going through this, walk through, the, like I mentioned, Sabbath afternoon talks about how uh, the new covenant life can be our experience even now, and that's mm -hmm. a good way to start. And then Sunday, it talks about the joy of the new covenant life, then the guilt freeness on Monday of the new covenant life, and Tuesday, the new heart of the new covenant mm -hmm. life. And what I essentially did was put those three experiential aspects in one talking point. Sure. Okay, so that the new covenant gives you a new heart, and from that heart, we're going to see things come out. But that's yes. Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday where it comes from. Uh, talking point number two, the new covenant gives you a new future. Now that should go without saying, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that while we do have temporal you blessings, say it gives you a future. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I thought about that in writing that. I thought about it finally gives you a future, but everybody's got a future. It's just really short, you know? and it's yeah. very uh, and fatalistic. And some could be very yeah. yeah some futures are going to be better than others. Exactly. So. This is a good future, and we'll see that in Wednesday's lesson. And finally, the third talking point: the new covenant gives you a new mission. Amen. And that's from Wednesday and Thursday. But everybody lives a mission, whether they know it or not. But this one is more explicit. It comes from within and from without. A lot to talk about. All but right. What is this new heart? The new covenant gives you a new heart. Well, in, we've seen as we've studied through this entire quarterly, in both the Old and the New Testaments, God repeatedly promises to give us a new heart That's to right. restore in us a new spirit. And so let's look up at a couple of those. Why don't you look up Jeremiah 30, or are you looking up I Ezekiel? Up, I was in Ezekiel. Okay, well, I'll go to Jeremiah 31. If you get to Ezekiel first, you can go ahead, because it's very similar wording. There. I'll read it. Ezekiel 30. Now, we referenced this in our last uh, lesson, last week's mm -hmm. lesson. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. The Bible says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Mm. Very similar, we see Jeremiah 31, verses 31 mm -hmm. to 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I had made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make after, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Mm -hmm. So those are 
again, you think, oh, that's New Covenant language. That's the promise. But those are Old Testament passages. That's what God's wanted that's all right. along. Similarly, we see in the New Testament. Let's look at a couple and of those. And the New quick. Covenant is an Old Testament concept. That's exactly, and that's the point, is that there's a single covenant, and that's why I like this whole quarterly, it's called the covenant, not the many covenants as a dispensationalist. Mm -hmm. But for instance, can you look at? at Ephesians 3, if you would, Okay. and I'll take a look at 2 Corinthians and see what the New Testament parallel to those Old Testament promises are. For instance, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 very simply says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Okay? Ephesians 3, 17 and 19, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of God which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And my mind immediately goes to, in our last week's lesson, our last point talked about how the imputed righteousness of Christ transforms us. That's exactly right. And and through Christ living in us, and right here, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and the new heart concept, all of this is speaking exactly. to Exactly. So it's not like God's just going to do a surgical operation. It's a spiritual operation where he breathes by his spirit and puts mm. his the life of his son in us, and we have a heart transplant. If yes. you will, we get a new heart, a new That's experience. Right. Uh, the quarterly on Tuesday, paragraph two. And just so that we, we're, we're clear, you know, we're not talking about, as you said, we're not talking about the organ pumping blood. Right. When the Bible talks about heart, it talks about, uh, oftentimes, about your affections. Right. In other words, we don't have, prior to coming to Christ, our affections are, are sinful, are carnal, they're, they're for self and selfishness. And so the new heart speaks to the idea of new affections. And I believe that those grow in our experience as well. So, for example, if, if one of our viewers is maybe thinking, you know, I just I wish I had more of a desire for the Word, and I wish I... Well, that's where that new heart brings those mm -hmm. desires, and that's what our hope is in, is those... God puts those desires in us and changes our desires and our likes and our dislikes and that kind of thing. Exactly. And, and the lesson brings out that exact point. In Tuesday, paragraph 2, it says, By Christ working in us, our lives are changed. Our hearts are changed. And we become new people with new thoughts, new desires, new goals. And honestly, the rest of this lesson is going to be looking at those new desires, the new goals, the new experience of that life in Christ. So it's not just a, I'll call you good and your life will pretty much be the same except on the paper books of heaven you're going to be encountered. <laughs> right. so he's like, no, no, Christ is going to mm. in, in, come into us. And he's going to do that spiritual operation that changes our Like that old hymn, live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings. That's right. I mean, it's exactly the experience. Now, the ancillary benefit of that heart transplant, if you will, that heart transformation is palpable. Ancillary, I like that. Yeah, it's secondary. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it flows in the train of. So let's, let's, let's put it this way. Yes. You had this previous war against God. Mm -hmm. You were at enmity yes. with his law. You couldn't keep mm -hmm. it. And honestly, and even, the, <laughs> even the desire to keep it was from outside of you. He's trying to work on you. But, yes. And you finally say, you know, I think that would be better. I don't want it. And you have a change of mind. You relent your will. You surrender to him. And he sends Jesus into your heart and you have this new experience. Now, what is that experience like? Now, the lesson rightly points out that we don't want to be driven by emotion. Right. We don't want to make decisions based on, you know, the fluctuating ebbs and flows and ups and downs of life. But how sterile would it be indeed if someone's like, well, I guess I've said the prayer. I'm good now, I guess. I mean, right. and you don't have any like palpable experiential difference, right? So the Bible does speak to the things like joy and peace and those tangible yes. aspects of that new life experience and that's what we can each have even now well how many people have you met as a pastor who have put off spiritual decisions they're like well i know what i need to do and once i'm done sowing my wild oats you <laughs> exactly. know when i get so old that i can't have pleasure in anything sinful anymore and i'm walking with my walker then yeah. i'll come in and give my heart because the christian life has got to be just drudgery you know yeah well and i i used to tell this to young people like a lot of times we look at the crosses of calvary and we envy the guy on the one cross who like he got to live the naughty life all the way up to the very and then he got in when the life of Christ is better even now. That's right. It's not That's fun. Right. So, for instance, the first thing, and this is one of the things well, that was brought to up our, in the lesson. Well, to our memory verse, the life more abundantly. Exactly. So what here does that look now. like in life the here and now? Uh, the, one of the things, that it was on um, 
Monday's lesson highlighted that one of the clearest things we can experience immediately is the freedom from the condemnation mm. and guilt of sin. So I'm thinking of first, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5, we were already there, right. but now verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that great exchange where Christ takes our sinful past, our sinful you know, record upon his sinless shoulders, can you imagine? I mean, when Christ stepped into Gethsemane, his sinlessness put on all the sinfulness of the world yes. and it almost crushed him out. Now, we can't feel what all of the weight of sin, but I do know what my own weight of sin feels like. And then to have that removed, mm. what, a, what, a, what a breath of fresh air that might be. Romans chapter okay. 8, verse 1, 1 There is that. therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Right, so because Christ has taken that away, I get to walk away breathing easy, mm -hmm. walking tall, not in my own strength, but praise God that he's given that right. gift of peace. You know, that's a the, one of the most immediate um, senses we can have is that God frees I think us from about, guilt. I, I can't help but think about this, you know, you get the, the, the social media generation with the, uh, you know, you basically vote your preference on anything by social media. And I think about people who have been castigated on social media, and some of them rightfully, criminals, mm. people who've done terrible, but you can never get away from it. You can mm. never get away. Can you imagine, Rhett, you went, you know, even if you, there is no repentance and forgiveness in this world, in mm. social media. It's so and true. Yeah. You know, it's like. We can talk about being loving and forgiving, unless you did this or unless you do that. And again, I'm not giving any personal example of a person, that, whatever else, but to think of having, because I've made mistakes in my life, mm -hmm. and to think of never being able to be free, yeah, ever, and the uh, versus having that condemnation lifted, right, as if you'd never sinned. Exactly. So we're not even I mean, talking about the second coming. We're talking about right here and now. Exactly that peace right. can be yours. That's right. Incredible. And then I would think the obvious outflow of that would be happiness, joy, yes, right? Yes. Let's look at First John chapter one. Um, this is uh, this speaks to that joy that we can have in the life of Christ. Um, I want you to read those first. So I want to go back verses. to what I said before. As a Please. Christian, as a Christian, I don't care what a person has done. We should always manifest the forgiveness of Christ towards people in hope that there is a potential of change. Amen. Just as Jesus would. Right. Well, all of us are sinful, and we look at everybody there, but for the grace of God go I. That's we have exactly to keep that mindset. But read First John 1, 1 through 4, if you would. First John 1, 1 through 4, And the reason, four, it seems yes. like, why are we going through those first three verses? Because the point is in 4, but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get there. Just go ahead. That which from the beginning, uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, obviously talking about their personal experience with Jesus. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Okay, so he's saying the reason we're writing you about our experience with Christ is so that you can have that experience right. with Christ. And what does they, they say that, that you would expect to have a of fullness joy. of joy. So there is a joy that comes, and the fellowship was in, in if, his presence. Yes, and if you and notice there, joy. Um, in verse 3, that you also may have the fellowship with us, and truly yes. our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So there's right. two fellowships, Mr. Jeff. First of all, you can have the fellowship that comes when the connection with God through the yes. sacrifice of Christ, which even if there wasn't another human being around, mm -hmm. that would be glorious. But he said, we've had it and we want you to be believers. part of this, right? So you have the fellowship with the believers too. So when you come in, there's a reason, Pastor Howard, and I don't have time to get into the sermon, mm. but we don't just come to Christ, we come into the body of Christ Absolutely. and we join in Christ. Um, so you think of the book of Acts and 3,000 were added to them. It didn't just say, well, take your name and now you've got it, now go your way. No, but there's there's a there's a blessing in sure. being connected. Think of with your Christ. own experience with the church. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I was going to ask the question, and it's an obvious uh, answer. The mm -hmm. answer is obvious. Have you ever had one of those experiences where you just had a miserable week, 
and then Sabbath comes, oh, and you come <laughs> among the saints, mm -hmm. and you're there worshiping, and yeah, all the saints, we've got all our flaws and problems, but there's mm -hmm. something about being among people right. who understand the gospel and believe yes. the same thing, and there's a fellowship that mm -hmm. is unmatched exactly anything right. else in the world. And that fellowship of spiritual and communal yes. is, is one of those benefits of the new covenant life that we can experience in the present Absolutely. tense, and that's powerful. Anyway, that's our entire first talking point, is that new heart and the experience, experience that flows from yes. it, joy and peace. Beautiful. But I must add to the next thing, the new covenant gives you a new future. Hmm. And quarter, the quarterly and Wednesday paragraphs one and two kind of bring this up. Why don't you read those first two paragraphs there? Yes, from Wednesday's lesson, it says, There are two dimensions to eternal life. The present dimension brings to the believer an experience of the abundant life now, uh, referring to John 10, mm -hmm. 10, which includes the many promises that we have been given for our lives now. And that's kind of what we've already covered so far, right. but continue. The future dimension is, of course, eternal life, the promise of the resurrection of the body. Though still in the future, that is the one event that makes everything else worth it. The one event that caps all our hopes as Christians. Now, it kind of seems like of all the things we've talked about, um, how you know you can have a connection with Christ and you can have peace, you can have uh, no condemnation, you can have joy and be connected with him and with the believers, that then to say like, but if we don't have eternal life, it's not really worth it. Right. It sounds a little trite, but that's actually, you know, mm -hmm. th th the point that Paul was trying to make. If you go to 1 Corinthians, or at least I'm looking at 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul was dealing with some people who didn't believe that there was a resurrection, even for Christ. That he, he might have lived a good life, a holy, perfect life, and taken our sin upon his shoulders and died on the cross of Calvary, but that's where it ended, was with the death of Jesus. He says, well, that's a big problem, because if Christ isn't resurrected, then our faith is futile, right? right? In fact, in verses 17 through 19, it says, And if Christ has not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And of course, falling asleep is the general euphemism uh, for dying, right? Those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And then he adds this statement in verse 19. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we have of all men the most pitiable. And th that seems bizarre. It's like, well, we do have peace and joy, but, you know, there's struggle in the Christian life. I, I want to add to that. Okay. Where the apostle was on trial uh, in Acts chapter 24. He's before Felix, the governor of Rome. He says, uh, and they, uh, speaking of the Jews who are accusing him, and they neither found me, I'm in Acts 24, verse 12, they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God meant. So you would think of all the things Paul brings up on trial. In his trial, he says, this is my hope, mm -hmm. the resurrection of the dead. Back exactly. to your point and his point. In, in his Christian point here, I mean, this is Paul would talk about joy and he would talk about peace. He talks and about fellowship. the blessed hope later on, all the resurrection kind of from the dead. But everything is hinged on Christ resurrecting himself and then in turn resurrecting us along with him. Mm -hmm. So if just Christ went back to heaven and lived and we just die like everybody else, uh, that's really not all that Christ wants for us, right? right? So uh, we can extol the blessings of peace and joy that we can have now, but short of eternal life, it's still not what God designs. In fact, I'm thinking of First Thessalonians because when we say that, I think you touched on this last week, that eternal life we often think of the we are talking, length we are of talking it. about in preparation. Maybe it was today. in preparation for it. But the, the eternal the, life the quantity is exactly like quantitatively. It's like it's really long. Right. It's unending, and that's what makes it different. So essentially it's the same mm. life now, it's just a really long version right. of it. But those, this lesson I think rightly brings out that those two dimensions. There's the quantitative life, like the eternal yes. life to come, but there's the quality of that life that can begin even now. That's and so right. praise the Lord for the quality of life. But even if that's all we had, and then we died like everybody else, like 
we would right. still be sold short. But sure. So the idea, even from the resurrection, the idea of the resurrection from the dead. What if you're raised just like we are? Right. And part of the hope is, especially as you get older, is <laughs> <laughs> which I can speak. He's to, like you're speaking here a little bit. Yeah. But you you think of that you're going to be restored. Not restor restored isn't even a good word. Like you're going to be better than, than you have ever right. ever it's been. The best version you've in ever your even own experienced. physical experience. Uh, the world around you, like it's just, it's 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 not even the best day you had in this life. Right, and it's already going to pass that up. So when Paul speaks about, for instance, those who had fallen asleep, he refers to that again in First Thessalonians four, mm -hmm. a passage we're very familiar with, verses thirteen and fourteen. Right. He says, "Brother, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope." Now pause right there. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear, Christians should sorrow in death. We're, we're sad that it yeah. happened, we miss our friends and loved ones, but there's a type of sorrow that's only for a season, mm -hmm. but we have a hope beyond it, right? Whereas those who don't have this hope, th there's a finality and a, and, a, and a depth of that sorrow that we yes. don't have to experience. And he explains why. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, or in the same manner, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So the hope of the Christian life is not just the quality of life we can have now, though praise the Lord, it's true, it's mm -hmm. the quantity that will match the That's quantity right. of the quality throughout all eternity. Um, why don't you read Desire of Ages 388, commenting on how this eternal life works now and into the future. What does Ms. White say? She says, Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave, not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith his life becomes has become ours. Mm. Those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have, present tense, everlasting life. Mm. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. Mm. So we can have eternal life now qualitatively and in a sense quantitatively because, yeah. now we don't have time to go into this, but the same power that the God has, God. exactly, the same power that Christ has unborrowed, underived, mm -hmm. to call himself from the grave and wake himself up, which I can't understand, mm -hmm. he's going to speak us in and into existence again mm -hmm. through that same power. And that is, that's something that, we can't even wrap our minds around, but it's the hope of the Word of God. It gives yes. us that. Well, we have to go to number three. All of this so far has been, what do I get? Mm -hmm. I get joy, I get peace, and I get a, a life lifetime. more abundant. <laughs> Amen. But if that's all that there's a Christian life, it would not be a Christian life. Because the new covenant right. gives there's us a, a little, new mission. There's a little more abundance to that life that we need exactly. to get, and it comes in number three. Exactly. And the unconverted life is inherently selfish because yes. we are selfish, so I look out for my own means, mm -hmm. put me first, and all this kind of stuff. But as soon as you come into that connection with Christ, you start seeing things through Christ's eyes and having new desires like Christ had, and his life was a life of service right. and a life of mission. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul talks about what that new heart is motivated to do. Absolutely. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 says, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Mm. And moving ahead to verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now you notice over and over again, this is one of the passages we looked at last week whenever we're talking about the imputed righteousness of God. Yes. But in the context here, as soon as you have that new life experience, the very mm -hmm. first thing you do is become an ambassador for That's somebody right. else, right? That's so right. there is no such thing as a selfish Christian. Mm. In fact, Sister White tells it this way in Great Controversy, page 70. She says, the spirit of Christ that dwells in us, right, mm. is a missionary spirit. The very first impulse of the renewed heart is to bring others also Amen. to the Savior. So one of the clearest evidences that your genuine 
conversion experience, your conversion experience is in fact genuine is you can't keep it to yourself. Right. You've got to find it's somebody and tell about. somebody and share your faith. Exactly. Yes. And just in case that weren't enough, obviously with Christ dwelling in us, his desires become our desires. We want to be missionaries like him. But on the outside, Christ also commanded us. It is a us. commandment. Exactly. So it's an internal like desire. Commission, if you will. Exactly. And it's an external command that we be missionaries for Jesus. Of course, mm -hmm. the most well-known passage about that is the Great Commission itself in Matthew chapter 28, uh, verses 19 and 20, where we're told to go make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and, and them to observe it, all things, all things right? And I'll yeah. be with you to the end of the world. And the idea being that from now on, once you become this, your mission doesn't end until Jesus comes back. Until then, go tell some people right. about it. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is in actually in the book of Revelation. Did you know, friends, that the book of Revelation closes with its own great commission? Mm. And Revelation chapter 21, look at verse 17. If 22. You, I'm sorry, 22. I apologize. Uh, look at that great commission passage. And you might not see it at first, but read it exactly as it's written. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. All right, so this is the very last page of the last book of the Bible. And there's the Spirit and the Bride, which is the church saying to the world, Come. It's an yes. invitation, right? And then it says, And let him who hears. Now, you made a mistake in asking me to read it because we've talked about this, but if you do this in your class, teachers. That's true. And you ask people to read this, they're going to read it wrong it, more times than not. They'll say, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears come. And they'll leave that say out of mm -hmm. there. For, for whatever reason, I've done training, and this is a lot Always. of people, that's how they hear it. It's like, let him who hears come. But notice that what's actually written is you have the Spirit of God and the Church of God calling the world to Give come. An invitation. Right. And then it says, and let him who hears, that's the receiver, yeah. say, come. That's right. So if you receive it, you've got to tell the invitation to somebody right. else. There's a great commission. The right? invitation. So commenting on this, Mrs. White writes in Acts of the Apostles, page 110, Not upon the ordained minister only rests the responsibility of going forth to fulfill this commission. Everyone who has received Christ is called to work for the salvation of his fellow men. The charge, and she quotes Revelation 22, 17, The charge to give this invitation includes the entire church. Everyone who has heard the invitation is to echo the message from hill and valley, saying, come. Amen. So this week we can see that the life of Christ is not just a hope for the future someday, mm. but we can have hope, we can have joy, we can have peace, and we can have a purpose, a mission that springs from within and is commanded from without that we are now ambassadors for Christ to give this message to the world. Which brings us a life more abundantly Amen. Even now. Even now. And our conclusion on Friday says so aptly, the covenant is not just some deep theological concept, Instead, it defines the parameters of our saving relationship with Christ, a relationship that reaps wonderful benefits now and at his return. Amen. Pastor Howard, can you give us a word of closing prayer? Father in heaven, again, we just thank you for the testimony of your word. Lord, we want that abundant life now. We thank you for outlining in your word how we are to get it, ultimately through Jesus Christ and by his grace, abiding by your will. I pray that you would continue to work in your church, that we would not just be hearers and recipients of the gospel invitation, but that we would give that invitation to others as the message swells to a loud cry and that multitudes, Lord, would be saved in your kingdom through mm. the, through, uh, the, the humble efforts of your church. We thank you for hearing and answering, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.